out of 10 Christian kids are leaving the church after turning 18. The question's why? Why would a kid like me or her just turn away? Maybe it's because it was never their faith to begin with. Maybe these kids woke up at the magic age of 18 and realized that they were told a lot about Jesus, but were never challenged to experience him for themselves. Maybe as Christian parents, we've been focusing on raising just good kids. We've told them that Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and then we've told them to go out and share your toys and be good boys and girls. What if the biggest obstacle to following God passionately is not the culture or the influence of the world, but a lack of faith in those leading these children and the ability to live radically for Jesus? And what if with the best of intentions, we were hindering them. What would a kid look like who was truly on fire for God? Can a child really know God? Would they pray when we're not looking? Would they seek his face on their own? And might they love his word as a lamp for their own path? The Bible tells us they can, and it's given us story after story of kids who have done just that. Well, maybe, maybe we just need to give them the keys. I want to begin speaking about um, a theology of child spirituality. And I know that sounds kind of like this, you know, treatise that Martin Luther, you know, 20, you know, 200 or 2,000 pages of what that would be like. But I really want to talk about the way that you see your children's Christianity, the way that you see your kids' spiritual life. Because I think the way in which you perceive the amount of Jesus that your kids can, can comprehend and, and access is the way in which you parent. See, what you believe about your kids is what you will give them. What you believe about your kids and their ability in Jesus Christ is how you will parent them. And one of the things we need to do, we need to be very careful that we're not limiting and hindering our children. And I'm going to talk about that. You know, one of the people I've been really inspired by is C.S. Lewis. I think he is one of the greatest child theologians of children's spirituality of all time. If you want to know what C.S. Lewis thinks that a child's life in Christ, a very young child's life in Christ can be like, read the Narnia series. Because in it, you just don't see children that are being told about Jesus. You see kings and queens that are, that are fighting real spiritual battles, that are doing real things for Jesus. You see Lucy able to hear the whisper of Aslan's voice. You see them being told about challenges beyond themselves. We've gotten really good at challenging our kids with only things that we know that they can attain. Good SAT scores, great colleges, all these things. But in, in the Narnia series, you see kids that are challenged beyond themselves. That if Jesus doesn't show up, they'll be spent. And so what we want to do is challenge our kids beyond that. So my question is, asking you, how Christian can your kids be? How much of the Holy Spirit do you think your kids really get? Is there such thing as a child-sized portion of the Holy Spirit? Now let me just start this whole thing by talking about a friend of mine. I went to Point Loma Nazarene College. Are there any, uh, um, what are they called, sea otters now, or whatever they're called? You guys all went there? I don't know what they're called now. We were crusade, we were crusaders, but now they're like, Sea otter, sea lions, yeah, there's some <laughs> form of, of pinniped. Um, nice use of the word pinniped right there, by the way. And when I was there, we had this guy, uh, he was like 23 years old, he just got saved the summer before, and he was from Texas, and his name, we called him Hoss, and the guy was just a Hoss. He was this big, giant guy, and I was afraid of him, but he was real nice, loved the Lord, and, and got saved. And one day he comes up to me, and he's, he's all, um, um, Big Daddy A, and that's what they called me in college, Big Daddy A. I don't know how he got, how, for, we'll just forget that. Just Adam. He said, Adam, um, I want, he goes, man, I got to introduce you to Ronald Reagan. And I'm all, you don't know Ronald Reagan. He's all, no, I know myself some Ronald Reagan. My, my, my grandpappy, lives, he didn't say all that, but lives right next door to him. And, and da, 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 and I'm just telling him, he's, you know, he's lying and this whole thing. He's telling me, this is right after I ran Contra and this whole thing, so I'm totally dating myself. Um, and he comes up, and then all of a sudden, he, he rolls up like a couple weeks later with a Polaroid. And it's him and a picture of Ronald Reagan. And I'm like, 
dude, you know Ronald Reagan? Well, this guy is spinning yarns about Ronald Reagan, about times on the ranch. I mean, all these different things he's done with Ronald Reagan. And I am fascinated because, you know, I just, I, I thought it was a crazy era. And I thought, you know, Reagan was just so, such an interesting character. And he's telling me all the things. Well, college, you know, ends. And one day I'm over at his house. He invites me to his house. And I walk in, you know, I walk in and go into where he's living, go into his bedroom. And in his bedroom is a stand-up cardboard Ronald Reagan. <laughs> The exact one from the picture, okay? And he's just standing there with a picture of Ronald Reagan. And for, what, two years, three years, I believe that this guy knows Ronald Reagan because he knows everything about Ronald Reagan. And not only does he know everything about Ronald Reagan, he's got a picture of Ronald Reagan. But all he knew was a cardboard Ronald Reagan. And let me just tell you this. I think we've had the last few generations of Christian kids, and all they know is a cardboard Jesus. I think these, you know, you know the stats right now. 60, 70, 80% of our kids leaving the faith right now. You've heard that. I'm sure you, it's, it's an overused stat by, by now. But the question is, is why? And that's what we as pastors, me as a, as a father, as a, as a, a pastor um, who has PKs, really concerned about having PKs, wanting to make sure that they know the real Jesus and that they, don't ha- that they don't come to know a cardboard Jesus. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we engage our children in the faith that, that they really know Jesus? How do we fashion children? that know the magnetic Jesus that you met. And you might not have met him as a child, or you might have been introduced to him as a child, but we have a moment, and most of you had a moment, like me, when Jesus became very real to you. And it's at that moment, or or most recently, where you, you dug in and Jesus became the everything of your life, and you've gone after that Jesus. How do we give our kids that Jesus as, as opposed to a cardboard Jesus? You know, one of the things I think, if you look at these scriptures that that we we see in um, children's ministry or in family ministry, one of the key scriptures we've been seeing that has been coming out is Proverbs 22.6. Proverbs 22.6, you guys know it. Raise a child up, what? In the way that they should go, and when they get old, they will not depart from it. We hold on to that like a massive promise, don't we? And then oftentimes we see parents that held on to that, but their kids haven't done that. And it causes us to question and ask why. And I think a lot of it is I've been trying to discern some things and asking the Lord what happened because why does the promise not meet the reality? Do you struggle with that sometimes when promises of God don't meet reality? And the thing that I'm looking at is when they say raise a child up in the way that they should go, what did did the original author mean? What did they mean in Jewish culture? What did Jesus, when Jesus discipled someone to truly know him, what did it mean? When you look at the way that Jesus took the 12 around and taught them how to be active followers of Christ, followers of Christ that were willing to die for him. There's a difference between that and followers who just know about him and those that walk away. And so one of the things I think we've done is we've removed so many elements of discipleship that we've just got a skeleton of what discipleship should really look like. And so one of the questions I want to ask you today is how are you discipling your kids? I'm not asking you how you're parenting your kids. Because I have, there's been a tendency to believe that if we're great parents and we're Christians, then we'll be, you know, it'll all work out and we'll be great disciplers. And let me just assure you, you can be a fantastic parent of your child and fail miserably as a discipler. There is a big difference between a great parent and a great discipler. Because if that were not true, it would mean that if discipleship had to be a component of great parenting, that non-Christians could not be great parents. I'll tell you what, I know a lot of, I know a lot of non-Christians that are fantastic parents, that are better than many Christian parents that I know. They give love, they give empathy, they give challenge, they give support, but they have no element of discipleship in their life at all. And so I think the same thing can be true. We can be fantastic parents. Un- unfortunately, some of the greatest challenges that we give our kids these days is that they don't have sex before they get married, that they don't drink or do drugs, and that they get into nice colleges. And what we've done is oftentimes, as a youth pastor for years, I've seen that that's been the highest bar that we have set for for Christian kids. Parents feel that if their kids don't have problems in school, they don't have disciplinary problems with their kids, if their kids don't do drugs and they get married as virgins, that they have succeeded as Christian parents. I want to tell you, that's the base minimum. That is, that is, just, that is basic Christianity. I mean, I don't even put that in the category with the disciples that were willing to die for the faith. When was the last time you asked your Christian kid if they were willing to die for Jesus? 
That's something that we take out of the, of the equation, don't we? We remove things from the equation, and we give them this package of what a, what a Christian kid should look like, but we remove the hardest elements of the faith. We haven't challenged them beyond anything greater than this world challenges them with. And I want to tell you what, if you, if you watch the Narnia series, and you look at the, um, not the language, the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, as you look at that, you will see that, that the character Reap Cheap is always looking beyond this world. He's always looking. He stands on the beach. And where does he always want to get to? He wants to get to Aslan's country. And that's one of the things that we want to challenge our kids with. It's something beyond themselves. You know, guys, we have to start challenging our kids beyond themselves. We have to start challenging with, with things that they cannot attain. You see, we always give our kids challenges that they can attain. But as believers, we have to be going for things that we can't attain unless what? Unless Jesus Christ himself shows up. And so when was the last time you challenged your child with something bigger than grander than themselves? You know, this is the age of the kid right now. Kids are doing, we, have, we just had a, what, a 14-year-old Justin Romero, he's 13, climbed Everest. Jessica Watson, 15 years old, sailed around the world. You have eight-year-olds going to college. We have all these things where kids are, we just, it is the age of the kid, all the kids that they can do. They're so equipped, they're so much more savvy than we were when we were kids. But yet, what we ask of them in the Christian realm does not match up to what the world shows that they can do. We see them exceeding in sports. We see them exceeding in drama. We see uh, you know, Will Smith's kids acting in movies. We see them doing all these amazing things, and we go, yay, that's amazing. But when was the last time you had a Christian kid say, I want to start an orphanage in India, but you're only nine years old, but I want to start an orphanage in India. I'll tell you what, if a 13-year-old can climb Everest, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, with your help and discipleship, can start an orphanage in India. You see, that's Christianity, and that's benevolence, and we have a whole generation of Christian kids that have never been challenged to be Christians. We've taught them about to what it looks like to have a cardboard Jesus. We've got to give them more than a cardboard Jesus, because a cardboard Jesus is not magnetic. There's no cost. We have to tell our kids that there's a cost with being a Christian that it costs you this, it costs you your reputation. Maybe you have to be rejected and despised, and maybe you'll die for the faith. And what I think is that you'll, be, you'll find is you'll be surprised that kids are desperate for challenge. We have a generation of Christian kids that are desperate for challenge. You want to know one of the, the things that I always used as a youth pastor when I had a kid who um, was not doing well, and his parents, all they want to do is discipline and ride the brakes, ride the brakes, ride the brakes. I, you know, one of the chapters in, in, in the first book I wrote, the discipleship book, Give Your Kids the Keys, is called Gas Pedal Parents. It's about giving kids challenge. One of the tools that I would use is I would look at these kids and I would say, you know what, I believe in you. You know what, w what about this? What if I make you a leader? You know, one of the best things you can do with a kid that's really struggling is make him a leader. I just had that recently. I had a guy in my ministry who was just struggling, struggling in his marriage, struggling. The Lord said, make him a leader. I'm like, Lord, make that guy a leader. The Lord said, make him a leader. I prayed about it, prayed about the Lord. I was sure it was the Lord. Made him a leader, boom, guy took off. How big is your challenge? And are you challenging your kids with the right things? I don't care if my daughter gets into Stanford. I don't care. If, I, I just don't care. I don't care if she's the queen of, the, of, the, of the, the prom. I don't care about any of that. So if it happens, cool. She best be using it for Jesus. Because we have bigger goals. I got bigger goals than that. And I want to show her that, hey, being a Christian ain't easy. You know, I'm not trying to talk my daughter out of it, my nine-year-old and my four-year-old, but I regularly ask them, do you think you're going to be a Christian when you're in high school? Yeah, dad, yeah, why? Why would you be a Christian in high school? Look what the world has to offer here. Look at this, look at this. Why won't you accept that? I want to talk to them. This is going to cost you. You might not be popular. Boom, boom, boom. I just lay it out and let them be challenged because I'm not afraid because what we, do, what we believe is we are giving her the real Jesus because I don't believe that the, real, the, the culture can compete with the real Jesus but the culture definitely can compete with a cardboard Jesus. And we need to stop doing that. We need to be families and get on mission. You know, one of the things I've seen is a, um, um, this, a parenting style that kind of reflects like shipping, if you think about it. One of the things I've noticed is we've gotten so good at treating our kids like cargo ships. We have moved from a faith back in the first three centuries and, and, and times after that where kids were pushed out to be ministers of Jesus Christ. There wasn't children's ministries as much as there were children who ministered in the first, second, and third century. Do you understand the difference? We've gotten really good at setting up children's ministries, but we're very poor at, at setting up places where children can minister. 
You see, you're, if you're a children's minister right now or you're a kid's in a children's ministry, I would challenge you to go to them and say, where's opportunity for my child to be a Christian? It's great. You have great education and we teach them the scriptures and they go to camp and we have smoke machines and bubbles and ponies and lollipops. But <laughs> serious. But, but, <laughs> that's funny. Um, but they're not cargo ships. You know, we have, we've moved to an area of provision and protectionism. Tell you what, where we have put our kids inside the harbor, and, there's an, and this is what we tell them. There's an open sea out there one day, and one day you're going to get to go on it. It's not now, because I'm afraid if anything ever challenged your faith that you'd become a Buddhist, or you'd go and want to be like Lady Gaga, or whatever it is, you know. So I'm not going to let you experience anything but we're going to keep you as secluded as possible, okay? In this, but we're going to fill you up. I'm going to send you to camp. We're going to give you all types of scripture. We're going to give you cartoons and puppets and all these things. And we might tell you about some great Christians. But we're not going to let you be a Christian. You're not going to stay a Christian long if you're not allowed to be a Christian. Amen. You're not going to be a Christian long if you're... Now, the amen screwed me up because I could have said it again. <laughs> <laughs> nice Amen. You got to be allowed to be a Christian. I'm not good at an amen in church. My group doesn't amen me. So, <laughs> and the other thing beside this cargo ship is this cruise ship mentality. Just a real cushy faith. We take our kids on a trip. We tell them about Jesus. We occasionally do a little something, but it's more of a cruise ship. Parents are in charge still. It's real cushy, you know. And and we're out there on the open sea, but you know we're on the Lido deck, playing a little shuffleboard, doing our thing, you know. And then there's another model, and this is the model that we're. I, I feel like. The only hope for my children as pastor's kids is a model of a clipper ship, a working clipper ship, where my kids are out on the sea, they're climbing the mast, they, it's dangerous, there are some opportunities for their faith to be tested and challenged, but we're on the ship with them. And it, but it's a working ship, and a ship where they know that they have a responsibility. I'll tell you what, you know what, guys, it's true. Ships are safest in harbor. Ships are safest in harbor. Your kids are safest for a while, not when they're 23, or 22, because that's going to change. But they're safest right now in harbor. But ships aren't built for the harbor. Ships are built to sail. And the question is, is when was your last time your child was, meant, was, was out sailing, was out on the open sea? And so we have this idea that you know, we're so concerned about the culture and these different things. And what we've done is in doing so and being so afraid and trying to protect our children, we've removed all testing from the waters. We've removed all testing and trial from their faith. We have kids that are not persevering. James 1.3 says this, it is the testing of your faith that develops perseverance. Remove the testing, no perseverance, straight up. Remove the testing, no perseverance. Does my four-year-old know about other religions? Yes, she does. I'm not afraid to tell her about other religions. I've had other parents tell me, don't tell her that. That might shake her faith. Her faith is going to be shook anyways. It shakes my faith. I'm a pastor, I went to seminary, I did the whole thing, and on occasion I'll walk down the street and go, man, how could all these other religions not be right? And I have these moments of doubt. We're not going to let them doubt till they're 17? How about letting them doubt now, while you're still in the game? How about letting them doubt now, while you're still on the playing field, where they can walk through that doubt? After, from four years old to seven years old, my daughter Lily Kate, who's a nine-year-old now, walked powerfully with the Lord. Powerfully, beyond what we were parenting her. This is where I got the ideas. She began to walk in a, in a fashion far beyond what I was parenting her, what Carrie and I were parenting her. Being a Christian in ways that we hadn't taught her. And at the age of seven, we were at Yosemite. We do a service trip there with our church. We go up there and volunteer in the National Park. And this is a place that feels like a, a cathedral of God. Um, but there's also a lot of um, spiritualism that goes on up there. A lot of witches, the whole thing, because they kind of buy into that truth of God, too, and they counterfeit it. And uh, when we were up there, um, the, I noticed that she wasn't doing well while we were up there. And Lily, this is two years ago, said, um, you know, Dad, I can't get this thought that keeps going out of my head that God's not real. God's not real. It just won't go away over and over. She was experiencing real spiritual attack. Let me tell you what, if you raise your kids like this, they're going to experience real spiritual attack, right? Because new level, new devil. Okay? But it's the same Jesus, so I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of the devil. The devil wants to make you all scared. Scared of the culture, scared of him, scared of this. You stand by your kids. You disciple them. And the thing is, is I didn't immediately just give her, I showed her the scripture, and I, but I, I didn't give her a bumper sticker. And the Lord said, let her sort this out on her own. Two years she went from seven to nine years old, doubting God. Went to Yosemite the next year, 
um, when she was, uh, it was last summer when she was eight, before she turned nine, and the same thing. She said, Dad, I'm, I'm here again, and I'm doubting God. And before we get to the end of where I tell you what happened with this, I've got to tell you something. That faith, which we all want our kids to have, doesn't exist without doubt. Otherwise, it's called foregone conclusion. You see, faith, faith has to have doubt, and it overcomes doubt. If you remove doubt from your children, if you remove where they look at things and, and they have to question if God really exists and things like that, if you remove that and try to hide that from them, you don't have faith. You have a bunch of answers and a foregone conclusion. And we strengthen our faith through the testing of our faith that develops perseverance. I cried and wept before the Lord as my daughter struggled with two years of doubting God, but I let her sit in it. And there was moments of good stuff in camps and this, but it kept coming back. And then about, I don't know, four or five months ago, we were sitting on the couch and we were listening to that song, Laura's song. And um, I don't know if you heard it. What if you're, you're, um, the greatest blessings come through teardrops and raindrops? And this, it's all a thing about when life goes bad, what if we were closest then? And there's a line in there, and I don't know the exact song. And Lily and I, we like to nuzzle on the couch. And we're sitting there, and we love that song. And we put the video on. She goes, Dad, put that video. I think it was like 6 in the morning. I invite her into my quiet time. So if your kids wake up while you're doing your quiet time, invite them in. Just like don't get upset that they're interrupting you. And it's a season. Invite them in. Do your quiet time with them. And so, because we get all angry, you know what I'm saying? And so, I know I do. Get up at 3 in the morning, they'll get up at 2.59. And <laughs> it's true. And we're sitting there, and, and I play the video, and they get to a part in the song where she says, what if when I, I think it's something like when I doubt you, that you're closest or nearest to me. And the Holy Spirit dropped on her, and her eyes filled with tears, and it, she just wept before the Lord, and God removed her doubt. And she came out of that walking so much stronger with Jesus. I want to tell you what, it was hard as a parent to watch her go through that. But we stayed the course, we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, we waited, we kept challenging her faith, and we didn't give her stupid bumper sticker answers that, hey, you shouldn't do that. Oh, well, Jesus is just real, so just forget about that. No, think about it. You need to doubt. You need to think about that. And so we've removed that. And so I want to ask you this. Now, granted, we're not throwing our kids to the wolves. We need to be wise. But have you, are you trying to remove everything that would challenge and your kid or challenge their faith? Have you remo tried to remove? Are you trying to put your kid in an environment where everything is removed so that one day they'll be strong enough to face that? I want to tell you what, the Holy Spirit that lives within them is strong enough to face that right now. You see, the culture and the devil is not stronger than the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is central. The Word of God is powerful. And the Word of God, if you're committed to discipleship, can go through anything because I have a feeling that if we want your if you want your kid tested, you want them tested when you're on the field. You want them tested when you're there. You want them to go through these things. You want them to see these things. You want them to experience. And you know what we end up protecting our kids against? We end up protecting them from God. We end up protecting them from God's work in the world in that. You know, we have a friend, um, Britt Merrick. You guys know Britt. He's a um, Calvary, or he was a Calvary pastor. He's a reality church, great guy. Daughter Daisy Love had cancer um, recently, and um, she's, I think she was five at the time, and she's had a prolonged battle, and, and he put the pictures of her dealing with her chemo, it's, the whole thing is on, and it's pictures of her, you know, she's six at the time maybe, getting chemo treatments. And it's hard to watch, some of you maybe have experienced this, it's hard to watch a five-year-old or a six-year-old get chemo treatments, you know, and so when we were sitting there watching, he put these videos on. And somebody said to me, I said, I'm going to let my daughter, we're going to watch these videos because, you know, I want them to pray for her. And somebody said, don't show your, your four-year-old that. Like, that's too hardcore. Like, she might, she might think that you're going to get cancer or get afraid or not know how to process it. Or, and once again, we have to be careful. But I just felt like showing her another child's suffering, like, and, and if, if this child has to have cancer, my daughter can at least know about it and pray for it, right? Because you can't hide it from Daisy Love. She's got to go to the appointment you know, and get the stuff put into her veins. And so we watched that. And I want to tell you something. A year and a half that they went through their battle, she's, she's healed now, a year and a half, there wasn't a prayer time we had, whether it was in the car, Lucy brought things up on her own at dinner. Whenever we prayed, she finished our prayers. And some of you guys have experienced this. And she said, and Jesus, pray for Daisy Love's tummy. Heal Daisy Love's tummy. Boom. She, she became an intercessor. She began to intercede. And when Daisy was healed, she, began, she knew that God heals. 
But we always told her God might not heal because we're willing to let her know that Daisy Love might have died. And Brett was, was very clear about that as he spoke about it. But she got to be part of the story. She got to be part of it. And, you know, we didn't hide it from her. And she's four years old, and I'll tell you what, she knows how to pray. When, when Carrie and I couldn't get pregnant the second time with our child, we struggled with both of our children. Lily, we asked her to pray for us. She prayed for two and a half years or three years as we were trying until we got pregnant. As a very young child, she prayed for that sister. I'll tell you, my, the relationship between my nine-year-old and my four-year-old is something I've never witnessed. They will walk down the hall. They will stop and look at each other, and, I, they'll, and I, they don't even know I'm looking at them. And one will say, I love you. I love you, Lily. And they kiss each other. They hug each other. Lily, Lily had a party at a friend's house the other day. She wanted to bring her four-year-old sister along. When was the last time a nine-year-old wanted the four-year-old to come with them? You want to know why they have that relationship? Because it was birthed in prayer. She prayed her sister into existence. That's why they act like that. And I'm not saying they don't go at it, too, you know, kick each other in the face <laughs> and all this. But we need to be careful that we're not protecting and we're hindering our children. Let me give you a great verse of, about this. Luke 18 talks about the little children in Jesus. And, and in verse 15, it says, the people were also bringing their babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. That's something we want. You want Jesus to place his hands on your kids, right? You don't just want to point to a Jesus over there that he's talking to the adults, right? You want to be touched. And it says that when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. The disciples rebuked them, the parents. But Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder him hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Do you believe Jesus when he says stuff like that? I mean, or is that just some little thing that Jesus says? You know, he just throws it out there. Let me just, let me just say it again. First of all, he says, don't hinder them. I, I really believe that the reason all these kids are leaving has nothing, I mean, it has a little bit to do with the culture, but I think it has to do with the church a lot more than it has with the culture. We're just not giving them a, 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 the real magnetic Jesus. And it says, so here's a, a picture of the church doing the same thing, hindering kids from coming to, to be touched by Jesus. You know, I ask you this. When was the last time you put your family in a place where you could all of you be, could be touched by Jesus? I mean, really touched by Jesus, like at an orphanage or on a family mission. What's your family mission? What's your family ministry? I'll tell you, if you're, maybe you're in ministry at this church or somewhere else or some other thing but your family doesn't have a ministry, together, you have a very short window to minister as a family. Bring your kids in. I, I, I wanted to bring Lily. I'm going to start bringing Lily, my nine-year-old, because she has a gift of teaching. I want to start bringing her here to teach with me and get like three minutes of time, just because I need to raise her up to teach. She's a teaching. She's a Christian. She's got a gift. She's got to use it. Do you even know what your kid's spiritual gifts are or their ministry? If your kid has, a, has, a, has, a, has a, um, the Holy Spirit within them, then they have a spiritual gift. That spiritual gift means ministry. Spiritual gifts equal ministry. Spiritual gift, ministry. What's your kid's ministry? At two and a half, my daughter, Lily, led Lucy to Christ when Lucy was two and a half years old. And it was real. It was authentic. The fruit of the Spirit was on her life. The gifts of the Spirit were on her life. She went from being a very selfish toddler to being a toddler who was very benevolent and giving. She loves to give. She loves to share. She is an encourager. She has a gift of encouragement as strong as any I've ever seen in my life. And you know what? When she accepted Christ, we didn't, we didn't doubt it. That's the thing. You know, I, I've spoken to so many parents over the last two years I've been speaking about these things that come up to me and they say, well, you know, my do I'm just, they accepted Christ. They told me they accepted Christ at three and they prayed the prayer, but just not sure if they get it. So I'm not really going to count it. I, that just saddens me. We're going to invalidate their faith because they don't get it. So I asked this guy, I said, so what don't they get? Well, you know, just the cross and what Jesus did and really fully understanding it and grasping it. And I said, okay. I said, so this eternal thing, this huge giant thing, they're not quite, yeah, that's it. I said, you get it? So you get it, okay, you get it, okay? The eternality of the gospel, of, of the cross, of what Jesus did, you get it. So the, the qualification is you've got to fully get it before you can be a Christian, Okay, let me tell you the difference between how much you get and how much your kid gets. I don't think I can put my fingers close enough together to show the distance. Because it's eternal, and you're finite, and so are your kids. And it's that far. Now, granted, we need to raise them up in the truth and let them understand and, and grow in knowledge and mature in these things. But don't doubt your kids' professions of faith. Nurture it. 
the seed falls, and it falls on rocky ground. And some of your families and some of the families in different churches and places I go, their kids, God throws a seed, and their kids are like a seed, and their parents treat their faith like rocky ground. And the faith that Jesus implants in their children is not nurtured and minister, and it doesn't become fertile. And I want to tell you what, the, 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 the fertility of, of, of our faith is found out in ministry. It is found in, in churches and teaching that's why I really struggle sometimes. I really, I really like, you know, the Calvary, especially like what, what The Rock does, because he's all about people doing stuff. You know what I mean? Like, I, I just really struggle when people come up sometimes, they're like, I'm going to go to this church, man, the teaching. Oh, the teaching. Oh, I just love the teaching, you know. We begin to worship teaching, you know, and it becomes a God unto itself. You know, we, our children's ministries can't be just about teaching. Our time with our kids can't just be about teaching. We have to be willing to spend ourselves and spend our family. Maybe you should adopt. We're thinking about adopting right now. We have our kids praying through that with us. And I'm telling my children the cost. You know, if we adopt, you get less time with daddy, right? You get less trips, Lucy, to Squishy Park. That's the one with the squishy ground that she can jump on. You know, Squishy Park. <laughs> Lily, you get less date nights, you know, because we're going to have a new, new, new you know. Uh, I just let them know the cost of it. And Lucy, she's four, she looked up, she goes, but we need to go to Africa and get a boy for daddy. And I was like, okay, <laughs> right on, I know, she's awesome. But, um, but we really, we don't want to hinder them. And we want to give them an opportunity to be Christians. Because here's what's happening. You guys know who Peyton Manning is, okay? He's a pro quarterback, or, or, or um, Drew Brees, or Philip Rivers. But you think about Peyton Manning. When his parents, you know, Archie, started preparing him to be a quarterback, let me tell you how he did not do it. He didn't say, hey, I was a professional quarterback. And one day, I think that you have the gifts and the talent. I can see that you have the gifts and the talent but I'm afraid that you might get hurt or take a hit. So I'm going to take you to Pee Wee League, but I'm, I'm not going to let you play. But I'm going to give you the, 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 the manual and the book. And it's kind of you know, scary out there on the field. But you can stand by me, and I'll let you know the coach. And, and then in high school, the same thing. I'm not going to let you play, but you know, I'm going to give you the rule book. And we're going to get box seats to the Colts. And we're going to, oh, it, these games are amazing. It's like the teaching, you know what I mean? These games are amazing. You're going to, play, you're going to meet the owner. I'm going to introduce you to all the players, OK? College, same thing. And then when Peyton Manning's 24, you suit him up, okay, or 23 years old. You suit him up, and you send him out there for the first play in the Colts game. What's going to happen to Peyton Manning? He's going to get crushed. We have a generation of Christian kids that are getting crushed, crushed, crushed. They can't even go to Christian college and stay Christian. Trust me, I went to it, okay? <laughs> if you can't go to a Christian college and stay Christian, where are you going to go, okay? We need to challenge our kids and let them be Christian. So my question to you is, where are you ministering? Where are you spending yourself? Are you more excited about your own comfort than about ministry? I bet you were real good. And it's hard to be hard because I'm, I'm speaking to myself. Trust me. I am really good at planning my vacations, okay? I'm a year out on those bad boys. You know, I'm like, where do you want to go? Let's start saving the money. Oh, that'd be amazing. I got it all planned. I, got the, I am so good at planning my comfort. Are you good at planning your own comfort? Your next time out for a coffee, your next meal, your next date night, your next whatever? Oh, really? When was the last time you spent that much time on your family ministry? Like, if that's a hard word, it's supposed to be. Okay? Because that's what we do. We give our lives away, and we let our kids see that we're willing to pay the cost with them. And so, you know, this all comes down to this idea of, of parental discipleship. The question is, 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 how do we disciple our kids? And if you haven't been discipled in a good model, then we need to figure out how to disciple. And discipling is a book, and it is going through the scriptures, and it is all those things, but it's out there on the streets as well. It's out there in ministry. I'll tell you what, we feel called... I was called at 19 years old. I know, my, my, I know that God spoke to me when I was 19 to put my kids in, in public school. And this is no, um, this is no um, um, mark against any other type of school system because I believe if God would have told me homeschool, I'm going to homeschool. If Jesus tells me private school, I'm going to put my kid. You, you, you would best seek God and put your kid where, you know, where they should be. There are parents right now who should have their kids in homeschool, but they're not willing to pay the cost of what it would take and the effort or whatever it would be. So they put their kids in public school. There's other kids, you know, vice versa and things like that. So let me just say with that, you need to put your kids where they need to be. And I'm sure you guys have prayed about that. But for us, when I was 19, God told me that I was going to be a public school. We were going to be public school missionaries. Tony Campolo came and spoke. And he said, we can't have a system where we take all the best Christian parents and all the best Christian kids and remove them from the lost. And not that there isn't a lot lost in private school. Trust me. I went to private school. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You know, because half the parents send their kids for your kids to fix them. <laughs> so it's cool. Everyone's all quiet right now. Sorry about that. 
Sorry about this part. Edit this part out for when the principal listens. No, um, the, you know, and, and so the, the, the point is this, is we feel like for us, we have an incredible ministry. But I tell you what, I'm uncomfortable with some of the things I have and challenges we have to face. You know what I mean? We had, you know, a, um, we had a, um, you know, a homosexual PE teacher when my daughter was a second grader, you know, third grader. How do I have that conversation? How do we do these things? For us, we feel like it has really sharpened our kids' faith. We feel the same thing is available whatever system you're in because the, the question is, is, do you have a heart for the lost? So whether you're in that school system or you're in this school system, my question is, is, is there a heart for the lost? Because there's a lot of lost in this school system, there, there, for sure. I've been, you know, look, I've been in the game long enough to know that this is an incredible ministry to a lot of parents. Same thing, do we have a, 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 a missions mindset? And do you have a missions mindset? You know, so finally what I would say is this, and coming in for a landing here, is that your kids are being trained in the way of Jesus, but they're not Christians in training, meaning they get a full portion of the Holy Spirit. There's no child-sized portion of the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a few verses. Acts 2.17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. The other verse, if you look in, I think it's King James, it says, on all flesh. That includes your children. Acts 2, 38 and 39, I love this. It says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The prom this promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And I want to assure you that God has called your children. He has called them to a deep and meaningful calling in their life right now. And he longs for you to partner with him into that calling, to figure out what their gifts are, to figure out what your family ministry is, and begin to believe that they can be just as Christian as you. You know, one of the ways that I, you know, at least it's in my, my family leadership model, is I think we've really, sometimes we make a mistake when we look at this model of like, well, dad's head of the family, right? Big head of the family, and then wife is humbly behind him with the veil, you know what I mean? And then <laughs> the kids quietly walk behind dad, who makes all the decisions, you know? And granted, you know, look, in my family, my wife is willing to defer to me on spiritual leadership decisions. I've been married 16 years. We've never, I've never once had to invoke that. <laughs> once. Never. Never once had to invoke, you know what, honey, I think we can't agree on this. We're going to do it because I'm the leader of the family, and I feel like God's, I've never once. In all the years of marriage. I don't get these guys that are, like, doing that all the time. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. I believe if we're one flesh, we're in unity, right? Where God's going to speak to both of us, and it will be the rare occasion where he doesn't, and it's all on my shoulders if I screw it up, okay? But what I see is this, is it's not just me leading this family. We have four Christians in my family, and all of them have the voice of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. All of them can speak to me. And I tell my four-year-old regularly, if you have anything to say to me in regard to the leadership, whether it be this adoption issue, whether you think that I'm, I didn't discipline you in the right way, you can come to me humbly, and you can come to me in respect, and you can tell me, and you can tell me. And I want to let you know that I might change the entire course of our family, Lucy, four-year-old, because you told, because you came and told me something. Because I believe that you can hear from the Holy Spirit. You know, when we don't do that, we begin to tell our kids that the voice of God in them doesn't matter. And you know, what I'm not trying to teach my kids is a bunch of do's and don'ts. They're going to know those things. I want my kids to know the voice of God. Because one day, when she's at a party, Someone's been drinking, and there's going to be a situation. There will, your child will have a situation. Okay? We all have a situation. One day they're going to be there, and she can think, you know, Dad said not to do this, and the Bible said not to do this, and what would Jesus do? I don't know. You know, and you got the bracelet, and she'll look at the bracelet. Maybe she'll make the right decision. But what I want is deep down in, the vo in her heart, I want that voice that you and I both know that says no, that voice of discernment that says no that whispers into her heart, no. Because I want them not to just know about God, I want them to know God. I want them to know Jesus. Parent your, your kids to know Jesus' voice. Ask them every day, what did God say to you? Send them into their room with their scriptures and ask them. At five years old, I was giving Lucy, I told Dana this, and she's been doing this over and over. I gave my, my daughter the scriptures because Jesus told me to quit being the Holy Spirit for my daughter. You know, that's an Old Testament understanding, right? We, have a, we, we seem to have this Old Testament understanding where it's like, okay, well, when you're a certain age, you can seek God on your own. But until then, I'm your parent, and I'll tell you what God says. Jesus died on the cross, so that system could go away. You get that? 
we need to remove it from our parenting. Our parenting it needs to be a model where we say, what is Jesus Christ saying to you? And if they're getting it wrong and you're hearing it, then you have the right to come in and because they're under your, 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 your shepherding. But I'm asking my daughters regularly, what is Jesus saying to you? When they go to school, what is Jesus saying to you? What is your burden? Who has he put on your heart? Who are we reaching out to? At five years old, I would send my daughter in because she came out and asked me a question one day about, about what she should do. And the Lord said, don't answer that question. I just knew in my heart, don't answer. I was like, what am I going to do? She asked me a question. And he said, Jesus, come on, give me, a, give me some help. He said, give her her picture Bible. It was an accurate description. It was a picture Bible. It was a full gospel. And so I gave her her picture Bible, and he said, give her some crayons and some paper. He didn't speak audibly to me. It was just a thought I had, but I, you know, at this point, I know the, you know the sheep know his voice, right? You shouldn't be surprised when people say, God said this to me, and God said, oh, what does that mean? It means the sheep know his voice. God, Jesus died on the cross, not to hide his will from us. There's this whole thing in Christianity that's like, ooh, what's God saying? I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. He died on the cross and gave you the Holy Spirit so we can figure it out. All you have to do is stay near him and put, you know, read the word and pray. He'll speak to you. So I sent her in with her Bible, sent her in with, a, with some crayons and some paper, and I said, go seek God. And she started seeking God on her own. She came out and said, what did he say? She found this thing about forgiveness or something like that. And she came out and she said, well, I just think God wants me to you know, ask forgiveness and, and, and sort this. It was the exact same thing that I had figured. And she did that over and over again. We would do that. And every, almost every time I'd do my quiet time, and I'd send her in to do her quiet time. She got up early. I'd let her do hers beside me. I'd say, hey, what does God share with you today? What did he show you? She said, oh, well, Moses this, or this picture of Noah this. And okay, and you would be surprised at how then God would weave that into her day, just like he does with you, because we're Christians. Stop being the Holy Spirit, okay? Jesus died so that you don't have to be the Holy Spirit anymore. We have to let our kids be Christians.